Hello and uh, welcome to online worship with us here at St Andrew's Church of Scotland, Brussels. Today, the 17th of December 2023, it's the third Sunday in Advent. And I've chosen the title, Open Our Eyes, Lord. You, some of you may remember chorus with that title some years ago, which we used to sing. But the point is this, Bethlehem, where Jesus was born, is a matter of five miles or so, maybe eight kilometres from Jerusalem, the hub, the heart of Jewish faith. And it's widely believed that at the time of Jesus' birth, there was strong expectation of Messiah, that he would come. Even King Herod seems to have been persuaded by it. And yet the record suggests that no one, no one within that powerful world, within the established world of Jewish religion, No one noticed that the saviour of the world was being born just a few kilometres away. Their eyes, as it were, were closed. They couldn't see. They were looking for something else. Well, that's what our theme is. Open our eyes, Lord. Open eyes to the presence and to the the power of God, but also to the presence of Jesus in those around us. That's really our gospel message today. And in our picture story from the excellent Lumo Project resource, we'll look at Mary's encounter with the angel Gabriel, bringing her the wonderful but scary news of her pregnancy. Let's begin with prayer. Father in heaven, we gather in your presence for your glory. We ask that we may have your heart, your passion, for those around us this season, that we might experience you in a new and a living way, that our eyes may be open to see and to see deeply. Our hearts may ponder the hope of Advent, the hope of freedom, of joy and peace. Lord God, thank you for inviting us into your family to become part of your story, that we might take part in your kingdom here on earth. So may our hearts, like Mary's, long for you and for your presence with us this Advent, and that we in the power of your Holy Spirit find our faith renewed and strengthened during this season of wonder. In Jesus, our Saviour's name we pray. Amen. So our opening hymn is the Advent hymn 273 in our Church of Scotland hymn book, O Come, O come, Emmanuel, let us worship God.
Psalm 95 verse 6 says, Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are honored to be your church and grateful that you created our world and gave us life. Each day, Lord, we are in awe of your goodness, power, and love for us. As we prepare to celebrate you sending your Son into our broken world to heal and save us, may our worship be holy and acceptable in your sight. You invite us in this moment to come and worship and abide in your presence. We thank you for the voices of our children in our worship this morning, and we ask that you bless them as well as each family represented as they give you the glory. Father, we are far from perfect, and we know we have fallen short of the standard that you have set and the example your son Jesus has given us. Forgive us for our weakness. Lord Jesus, Thank you for showing us what love in action looks like. Because of your birth, death, and resurrection, we now have access to your continual presence. Thank you for sacrificing your life for ours. Thank you for making a way for us to dwell with you forever, through your dwelling with us, through Jesus. In reverence, we pray together the way you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, in the north of Israel, about 140 kilometers away from Jerusalem, is a town called Nazareth in a region called Galilee. There's of course a big lake or a sea, sometimes it's called a sea, up in that area. And 2,000 years ago there was a young woman called Mary living there. She was probably still a teenager and she was betrothed, the Bible tells us, that means she was planning to get married. She was engaged to a local man called Joseph. And one day God sent an angel a messenger called Gabriel to visit Mary because he had news for her. Greetings, announced the angel. You are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. In other words, you're very special. You're very special in the eyes of God. Which I guess sounded like good news to some people, but Mary was really troubled. She'd never had an experience like this before. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel said. You've found favour with God. You're to give birth to a son and call him Jesus. He will be great and will be the son of the Most High. Well, Mary was even more worried now. How can that happen? She protested. I am a virgin. I've never been with a man. The Holy Spirit will be the father of your child. 
the angel explained. The Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. You need to know that the God that God promised a son to your relative Elizabeth, who was way too old to have children, and she's now six months pregnant. What God says never fails. His word is sure. I, I, I am the Lord's servant, Mary replied. May your words come true. And the angel left her. And I can only imagine how scared, how mixed up, how delighted, how excited, how hopeful, how full of emotion young Mary was at that wonderful news. The first reading is from Ezekiel chapter 34 verses 11 to 16 and 20 to 24. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places when, where they are scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them out from the nations and gather them from the countries and I will bring them into their own land. I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines and in all the settlements in the land. I will tend them into a good pasture and the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. There they will lie down in good grazing land and they and there they will feed in a rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will tend my sheep and have them lie down, declares the Sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak, but the sleek and the strong I will destroy. I will shepherd the flock with justice. The second reading is from Matthew chapter 25 verses 31 till 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you do, did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, 
When did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Thanks be to God. Now, something I've not noticed about this very familiar passage, one I'd read many times before, is this. Neither the kind nor the unkind people in Jesus' parable realised that the poor and needy were reflections of, representations of Jesus. They didn't see Jesus in the people whom they cared for, or on the other hand, didn't care for. And they both ask essentially the same question, verse 37 and verse 44. Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? The kind, the kind people, the, the sheep in the parable, aren't congratulated for seeing Jesus in the needy people because they didn't. They just treated everyone with grace and love. And to take this one step further, when the unkind people are criticised for failing to act so mercifully, we could imagine them saying, well, how are we supposed to know that they were reflections of you? Because if we had known, of course we'd have been kind and gracious. And that is part of the point that Jesus is making or at least the answer to that question is, you should treat everybody well. You shouldn't need someone to tell you, be nice to this person, but don't bother about that one. He doesn't matter so much. I say that because that's what we learn to do as children. As we grow up in society, we learn to be careful about how we speak to some, some people because they're important. But sadly, we also learn through our culture not to bother so much with others who have less influence and who are in the eyes of those around about us therefore less important and that's the heart of the problem that's what jesus is getting at it's wrong to do that everyone matters everyone's important you have the right to ignore no one so if we were if we ask the question, how were we supposed to know that they were reflections of you? Jesus would answer, you didn't have to know. You didn't have to know that it was me in those people. It should have been enough to realise that that other person was a human being created in the same image of God that you are. You didn't need to know it was me. If you just responded to their humanity, you'd have been doing the right thing. And of course, some of them did. This passage is indeed about what we do and how we act towards people. And we'll come back to that in a moment. But that, I don't think, is the heart, the beginning, the, the start of the matter. Because the start, the beginning point is this. Are our eyes open? That's why I've given this message, this service, the title I have, Open Our Eyes, Lord. We're looking at this a few days before Christmas because the coming of the Messiah was so, well, almost completely not noticed. And that in itself is staggering. Most people's eyes were shut. They were looking somewhere else or for something or for someone else. Mad or rather greedy, powerful, power mad King Herod almost got it. But well, otherwise it was just the shepherds, the wise men and the participants. But of course what Herod did with the, the realisation that this may have been indeed the Messiah being born in Bethlehem was to command all the youngsters to be killed. So the question is, do we pay attention to life as it is, as we live it? 
or do we go around in our own private bubble? Did we notice that lonely person? The other one who lost her job? The person who used to come to church but doesn't anymore? Are our eyes open? That's the start. That's the beginning point. Because it's true, we, we, we miss so much. We know that we're saved by grace and not by what we do. The Jesus who's speaking here in Matthew 25, of course, knows that. But he also knows that grace, that faith, opens our eyes to see things that we would otherwise miss. Thornton Wilder wrote a play called Our Town back in 1938. Some people think it's the finest, the best piece of American theatre ever written. The central character is called Emily, and she's given a chance, following her death, to review an event from her past. Any event, any day, but it must be a fairly ordinary day, not a special day in any way. And she chooses to revisit her 12th birthday. So she goes back to that day, and what happens is that she discovers hundreds of things that she'd completely forgotten. But what shocks her is how little she, or indeed anyone, paid attention to what was happening on that day. In the end, Emily can't bear to watch anymore, and she says, I can't, I can't go on, she cries. We don't have time to look at one another. I didn't realise. So all that was going on, and we never noticed. Do any human beings ever realise life while they live it? Every, every minute, she asks. And the answer is no. And another character tells her that most people move around in what he calls a cloud of ignorance. And it's true. We're too concerned about how we look, how we sound, what people will think of us, how annoyed or bored or guilty or anxious we feel about something else. Most people move about, indeed, in that cloud of ignorance. They're not really there. So it's no surprise that we say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and didn't help you? Because we don't notice. And sometimes, on the other hand, we do the most significant things. But at the time that we do them, we don't realise how significant they are, how important they will turn out to be. So that's the, the start, the heart of the matter. Seeing, having eyes that are open, truly open. Being here now, being present and not taken up with worries or fears or pride or, or whatever. Being in the moment, some people call it. But then comes, should come, action. First we need eyes to see, and then comes action. And what Jesus is saying is that our words will be of less importance than the way we lived, with compassion, with kindness, with love for others. Those actions will be the proof that we have open eyes, and that God's Spirit has touched us. Our actions don't save us. Only Jesus' death is adequate for that. Actions don't save us, but they are evidence that we've been changed. And that's the example Jesus gives us. All through the Gospel we hear Jesus' words, but above all we see him at work with compassion and mercy, all the way from the wedding at Cana, or sick being healed, healed, the tax collector being welcomed, the adulteress forgiven, children embraced. Faith and trust in God are expressed in caring, loving action. We saw a few weeks ago that Jesus taught that loving God is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is very much like it, love our neighbour. To keep that second commandment, we must be committed to the first having our whole selves, mind, body, heart, given over to God. The God who is love enables us to love well. Now, 
you know as well as I do that there are people out there who get this the wrong way around and who consciously or subconsciously do loving things, kind things, good things in order to win your affection. Try to deserve God's love. As children, we do that. We may learn that when we do certain things, we get a reward from our parents, even if it starts with the reward of just a smile. But we do the washing up, or we tidy our room, we help with the shopping, and the thanks we get, maybe the reward we get, the present we get, tells us we've earned their affection and done something good. But that's not real love. That's not spiritual love. So as we grow up and become parents, we need to grow on for that as we become grandparents. We need to mature. We need to learn to show love unconditionally, not just because our children are nice or pretty or clever or because they do good things, but just because they're our children and because we love. And that's the way God loves us. From the very start of the Bible, in Genesis through Exodus, Leviticus and so on, we get the same message that Israel is loved in order to love others. Israel is blessed in order to be a blessing. And that goes for us. Sensing that we're not only accepted, but blessed and loved by God changes us. We love both God and others because God first loved us. Now, as I say, that's not the way some people see it. Many adults, truth be told, have not yet grown up. And they still see love in that childish way as a kind of barter, as a kind of commercial thing. I will love you if you give me back the reward I want. Something that maybe some people deserve and others don't. That was the problem, of course, with the religious leaders who criticised Jesus because he welcomed the sinners and the lepers and the rejected folk. Those religious leaders thought that people didn't deserve love, didn't deserve attention. But Jesus' actions tell us something about his fundamental belief, that real love has to be unconditional. And people change when they're loved in that way. To do it the other way around and to expect them to be nice and sweet and good before we welcome them and love them is a mistake because it's love which changes us. Now, there's a dark side to this, dark side to Jesus's parable. And as Chelsea Harmon points out, the alternative to caring and loving the broken and the lost is not pretty. Jesus describes people who refuse to believe and refuse to love others as cursed in verse 41. Strong word, not one that he used a lot. And these are people who have shut themselves off from the love of God, who deliberately act against the will of God. Denying yourself God's love is disastrous to you and to others. It's a surefire way to fail, to path to disobedience. Now, we all know, we all know none of us is perfect, we keep failing in our walk with God. Of course we do. We, we stumble. But there's a big difference between, on the one hand, keeping on trying and sometimes failing to love. And on the other hand, making excuses or refusing to listen or living in our own private bubble so that we can go our own way. That sort of self-deceit destroys the soul. It's the point that Jesus is making. And don't forget, this is a parable, which means taking it literally is wrong. But the deeper truth is true. We damage ourselves, we destroy our souls when we fail to love. Finally, there's been a lot of hoo-ha about what Jesus meant when he spoke about the least of these there in verse 45. What did he mean? Some writers have tried to argue that he meant believers, people who are with us, not against us. Up in the north of Scotland, I had the experience of some, I must say, a minority of Christians who would only eat and drink with you if, they, if you were a member of their church fellowship. If they needed a plumber or an electrician, they would go to one of their own. 
and they were very supportive of one another. They would give generously to needy members of their church fellowship, but not usually to unbelievers, as they called them. And I, of course, was one of those unbelievers, as they saw me. Now, if you think about it, that goes directly against what we understand mercy to be, because mercy is always undeserved. Jesus, after all, told his disciples that they needed to give and not expect anything back. He said it in Matthew 5. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Don't the tax collectors also do that? So when Jesus spoke about the least of these, he didn't mean just the people that are with us, just people in our own circle of friends or family or church fellowship. No, he meant everyone, everyone from the very smallest and poorest and most neglected people upwards. All of these were called to care for. So this Christmas, I'd invite you just to check that your eyes are really open. Maybe they are. God bless you if they are. Mary and Joseph, the shepherds watching their flocks, the wise men, Mary, the Magi in the East, all had open eyes and ears and were therefore available to be used by God in this wonderful miracle of Christmas. But the religious people, as I said a moment ago, in their comfortable homes and rigid traditions, did not. And they didn't notice that the Saviour was born just a few kilometres down the road. A bit like Emily in the play I mentioned a few minutes ago, who realised that neither she nor others were really paying attention to life. They weren't really in that moment. But when our eyes are open, we can see Christ in the orphan child in Gaza, in the widowed soldier's wife in Russia, the political prisoner in Iran, the homeless man in Brussels. When our eyes are open, we notice the hurting person near to us and the man or woman whom we used to see in church, but do so no more. So open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus in the men, women and children all around us. Amen. Now let's bring our prayers for others. Let us pray. God of all nations, your love is without limit and without end. Enlarge our vision of your redeeming purpose for all people 
by the example of your Son, make us ready to serve the needs of the whole world. May neither pride of race nor hardness of heart make us despise or ignore any for whom Jesus died, any who suffer this day. Mighty and merciful God, we pray for the welfare of the natural world all round about us. The thousands of species dying out due to climate change, or loss of habitat, especially woodland, the endless greedy hunting by humankind. We give thanks for those people of goodwill and passion who have met recently in COP28 in the Middle East, and we pray for the words, we pray that the words that they have agreed may become actions, actions which slow, halt and reverse the damage already done to the climate and to the planet. And we pray for ourselves, that our lives may be open to the damage that we do to the world in which we live, our carbon footprint. Give us courage, we pray, to live more simply, that others may simply live. Release us from our addiction to damaging lifestyles and teach us to care for the welfare of the poor who suffer most from climate change in lands far away, most of them. But also we pray for those who will suffer in future generations, who will need to live with the consequences of our lifestyles. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to see what we are doing and change. Have mercy, Lord, on all those who are in any kind of pain, those who are unwell at home, in hospital or elsewhere. Deal gently with those who sit in darkness of depression or loneliness or despair. And give strength, we pray, to the homeless, the workless, and indeed the hopeless, the men and women and children all round about us. Grant that as individuals and as a church, we may meet their need and care for them, as Jesus taught us to do. Be gracious, Lord, to those people who are damaged by war, by famine, by floods, by disease, by persecution. And we pray in particular for the ongoing fighting in Ukraine and Gaza and elsewhere. God of all peace, bring an end to the killing and enable differences to be resolved fairly and peaceably. And we pray that all people, in whatever corner of the world they live, may live in security, free from want, with hope for the future. And now hear us, as in a moment of silent prayer, we pray for those for whom we have our own personal concern. Hear us as we name them in the secret of our own hearts. All our prayers, Father God, we bring in and through the strong name of our Saviour Jesus, whose we are and whom we seek to serve. Amen. Come, let sound the Saviour comes, the Saviour promised love.
Thanks once again for joining with us in virtual fellowship, virtual worship today. And uh, along with those thanks, I hope that it's possible for you to join in live worship and fellowship this Christmas, whether it's with us at St Andrew's Brussels or at a church nearer to you. Nothing can rival the experience of true Christian fellowship, but I appreciate that's not possible for everyone. And at the same time, we're deeply grateful to those who make this online service possible, especially our excellent and very faithful, hard-working video editor, John MacDonald. This evening, 17th of December at 18.30, 6.30pm if you prefer, we have our service of nine lessons and carols live in the church. Always a special service with contributions from junior and senior choirs, readings, and of course, congregational worship. After that service, we've organised mince pies and such. Downstairs, do join us if you're able to do that. You'll be a blessing to us. Next Sunday is Christmas Eve, and we have our usual services uh, here online and live in the church. Then in the evening around half past 11, 23.30, we have our online watch night service. We don't have a watch night service in the church though, only online. On Christmas Day we have a family service in the church but we don't have an online service that day. So we're online only on Christmas Eve, live only on Christmas Day and that live Christmas Day service we have a collection to support those who work with homeless Scots in London just as we usually do. Now thanks to those who've been kind enough to contact me these past few weeks during my rehabilitation from the hip operation I had uh, some four weeks or so ago. Things are going really well. In addition to walking and cycling and all those rather painful stretching exercises, my physio has got me working on stairs and steps because, as you may know, the St Andrew's Mance has an abundance of steps within it. A few people have asked recently about what's happening with our proposed link with our sister church in Paris, Scotskirk, Paris. And the answer is that it will not now happen. There are practical and other issues on the Belgian side which make it impossible uh, for the link to be created. So we'll continue to be as we are, with a full-time minister, with our reader, Sia, and our OLMs, ordained local ministers in training, uh, David, uh, Lloyd and Marlon uh, Gilbert Roberts. Now, today, on this very special day, as we look towards the coming of our Saviour Jesus in just a few days, let us pray. God of all grace, we seek your gift of peace, of love, of joy and hope this Christmas. Open our eyes, we pray, that we may see you in those all around about us. And may God's grace and mercy and peace be with us this third Sunday in Advent, this coming week, this Christmas, and forevermore. Amen. Amen.